So your new book, The Burning Chambers, um, it's essentially a love story set in Carcassonne. And um, it's set at a pivotal moment in history, the War of Religion. So um, how did you choose to set it, set it, set it in Carcassonne um, well, at this time? All of my historical fiction are love letters to Carcassonne. Mm -hmm. um, we first bought a tiny house there in 1989. Mm. And I fell in love with the place. And for me, um, exciting fiction is always about that conjunction of place and history. Mm -hmm and the idea that you couldn't write that story anywhere else. It would have to be set there. Um, so that's really my inspiration. Carcassonne, the place, is, mm. is the biggest character in most of my fiction. Mm -hmm. And with this one, uh, which is set in 1562, and mm -hmm. it begins on the eve of the Wars of Religion, yep. that will destroy France. It will tear France in two, and it will leave a country after eight civil wars in the 1590s completely mm -hmm. ruined by itself, really, by these re this religious conflict. Um, oddly, it started on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. It started in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And learning that seven Huguenot families, refugee families from Amsterdam, mm -hmm. in 1688 had sailed mm -hmm. from the Netherlands mm -hmm. to South Africa to begin planting vines. Wow. And I was there in this tiny uh, Cape town called Franschhoek, yeah. and I was driven into the main street, and it was called Huguenot Street. Uh -huh. So I was like, this is really strange. And so then I went to the museum, I started to learn all about it. And to start with, I thought, don't write this, Kate. Mm -hmm. You know nothing about South Africa. You know nothing about the Huguenot diaspora. You know nothing about the 17th century. Mm -hmm. But it was just, it wouldn't leave me alone. Yeah. And so, of course, for me, the moment I decided that I did want to write about the wars of religion, yeah. of course, the story was going to start in Carcassonne. Absolutely. So how do you go about um, researching your stories? Do you start um, at libraries or archives or yeah. do you go to places first? And Always the place, really, for me to yeah. start with, because there are many beautiful and brilliant places in the world, but they just mm. don't speak to me as a writer. Right. You yeah. know, they speak to me in terms of sitting in a cafe and having a glass yeah. of wine, but yes. <laughs> in terms of, for me, it's always um, the way, it, it sounds daft, but it is what it feels like. Mm -hmm. is there are certain places I can hear the whispering. Mm. It's the idea of voices in the landscape, um, yeah. voices of the past imagining what it mm. would have been to have lived in that time, yeah. in that place. And with, um, research it's that that sort of initial emotional response has to come first and it did in franchuk you know standing mm. in the huguenot graveyard mm. of the huguenot museum in franchuk wow. looking up at the mountains and thinking they look like the mountains of Languedoc. yeah and what about a story mm. that the prologue will begin in 1862 in this beautiful town mm. in so south africa but the beginning of the story will be 300 years before when the wars of religion started. Mm. And out of that moment of emotion, if mm. you like, standing in the graveyard, I thought, okay, this is a Romeo and Juliet story. Yeah. This is a Catholic family, a Protestant family. This is 300 years of history. This is a feud mm -hmm. between these two families, a missing will, a relic, and before yeah. I knew it. So <laughs> then I go to the archives, and mm. then I go to the books, and to the mm. libraries, and to the museums. Yeah and I start to research mm. the period, the place, the history. Because mm. it is sort of tantalizing, isn't it? Going yeah. to a place where there's so much history and being confronted with all of that and wondering what, yeah. the, you know, yeah. those people who they, who they, who you know, they were, were and what their stories exactly. were. Yeah, that's so exactly that's right. And what sort of people, you know, in a way as a historical, mm fiction novelist, what I'm, I write the stories of us. Yeah. I'm not writing the stories of the court. Mm. You know, there's a great yeah. deal of brilliant 16th, 17th century literature, mm. but it is almost all about the tiny 1% of people. Yeah. So my stories, it's always about who would I have been? Yes. Who were all the other normal people yeah. whose lives were destroyed mm. by the forces of history? They're mm. destroyed yeah. by the kings and the queens and the popes and the generals. They have no control over it. Yeah. So for me, I need to learn the big history mm. in order to then be able to burrow down yes. and write the story of a normal girl yeah. in a normal town going to work at the end of February 1562, mm. going to her father's bookshop, yeah. having no idea 
that something will happen yeah. hundreds of miles away yeah. that will begin the wars mm. of religion and her life will change forever. Yeah. yeah. But I think that's really important actually because like you say so many people write about the um, you know the court and yeah. uh, but, uh, and they do it not, brilliantly, but, yeah, but there's absolutely. enough, you know, yeah. the, the rest yeah. of us were there too. So as a writer of historical fiction, uh, you inhabit the place where um, history becomes mythology, but you clearly have a deep love and fascination for real history, so where did that come from? I think my love for history, which for me is just a different form of storytelling, mm -hmm. came absolutely from growing up in a very old and ancient place. Mm -hmm. um, Chichester in West Sussex, where I, I live now. Mm -hmm. um, and that combination of being in the uh, Georgian heart of the city mm. that are ringed by Roman walls. So you, you don't think of the cathedral as being a museum or something in the past because it's where you go and do your school concert. Yeah. You don't think about the Roman walls as being something behind a glass wall to be studied mm. because that's where you sneak round the back and in the old days, you know, to have a, yeah. you know, whatever we all did round the back of the bike sheds, <laughs> as it were. Um, all of those sorts of things. So I think it's partly that. Mm -hmm. And then also going out every, you know, at the weekend and in the after school and all the rest of it, walking up on the downs of Sussex, mm. um, ancient Iron Age barrows up there. Yeah. Uh, Kingly Vale, which is the oldest yew forest in Europe. Wow. And then climbing to the top of the Trundle, yeah. which is the highest point in that part of the Downs in Sussex. And you can look down and you can see the sea, and you can see the spire. <gasps> that and sounds course, magical. Yeah. It's yeah. magical, and, yeah. and also, <laughs> but, it, but it's where you live. Yeah. And I think that's why when I first went to Carcassonne, mm -hmm. I felt this immediate sense of belonging, mm. um, that there history is alive. Mm -hmm. It's, you walk around those streets. Yeah. So for me, I think it's that, the idea that history is not the past. Mm. It's just the story of those people that came before us. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't study history at university, but I've always read a lot of history. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, your lovely phrase, history and mythology, the things that get written down in the history books are partial mm -hmm. and they are written with an agenda. Yes. And women are lef left out a lot of the time. Yeah. Working class people are left out. Mm. People of color are left out. Mm -hmm. people, you know, people who don't fit that one narrow band. Yeah. But I think for me, therefore, the storytelling of history is very important because mm. I think sometimes through fiction, yeah. you can stand in other people's shoes and you can tell ordinary people's stories, mm. ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. Yeah. Whereas the history books are always written with a point of view. Yeah, they always say history is written, you know, by the victors. So It's true, but it's yeah. also written with an agenda. Yeah. Um, so quite often people will say to me, you know, my, my books have women's stories at the heart of them. Yes. Will say, well, you know, but would women have done this, that and the other? Mm. And I'll say, just, just think about it mm -hmm. now. You're right that the image of women of the 16th century is everybody somehow are sitting around sewing. Yes. <laughs> but that's, of course they weren't, of yeah. course they weren't. And yeah. the men were away at war. Mm. So who do you think was opening the bookshops? Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, who we was were running too, it? You yeah. know, it. So it's, it's that, it's really about, the, I think with historical fiction, y you, you can use your common sense, mm. you know. Yeah. And history books, you, you know, you're right, written by the victors, but also written with an agenda. Mm. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how important is it for you um, to um, have leading ladies in your books then? Um, is that Well, well I mean, I, I'm a woman, so yeah. why would I not write yeah. lead characters who are women? You know, in a way yeah. I find that... It, it, I'm always surprised it's just, when it's people not, ask you know, it's, it. Yeah. yeah, but it's not yeah. very common. Um, it's no, I think, I think that there's a, obviously there's a sense of... Um, who is the hero of mm. a story? Um, for me, the hero is the protagonist. Mm -hmm. And they could be of any colour, any shape, any yeah. age, any gender, mm. any physical ability, any faith, any of these things. Mm. For me, it's about the character that comes to you. Yeah. In almost all of my books, the first person who presents themselves and says, hello, you write my story now, yeah. um, has been a female character. But mm. one of my novels, The Winter Ghost, it was a male character. Mm -hmm. um, because the, that's what the story would be. Yeah, yeah. So for me, when I was writing Burning Chambers, mm. it was a question of I know 
the sort of story that I'm going to write. I know it's this Romeo and Juliet story. I know it's going to be 300 years mm. of history. I know it's about the Huguenot diaspora. Yeah. And then I kind of hold my breath and wait for the characters to come and play. Yeah. And I never know quite who's going to come. <laughs> and, and sometimes quite unexpected characters become really big. And other times, um, people that I think are going to be really important, they just, they let me down. Oh, you know, they're, yeah. just, they're just not really there. So, but it's very important because I think it's the same issue that the way that history is written and the way it's presented leaves yeah. women out. Yeah, that's and it. We were we were always there. Absolutely. We were always there doing stuff. Yeah, of course. So um, a lot of your fiction is set in southwest France. Um, indeed, uh, you know you split your time between Carcassonne well, and I France. Well, I used to. Or, I mean, okay. I'm, no, I'm based in the UK. Now. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Um, so it's spanning a huge sweep of that region's history from mm. the Cathars to the Huguenots and the wartime resistance. It's a rich landscape for historical narrative, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I think um, for me, one of the reasons The Burning Chambers is so important to me and I've loved mm. writing it and publishing it and being out and about talking to people about it mm -hmm. is that it's the first time I've ever planned a sequence of books. There'll be four books. The Ooh. first one is set in the 15th century, mm -hmm. the second one is set at the end of the 15th and the 16th century, the third is the 17th and the mm -hmm. fourth is the 18th into 19th. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that obviously it's the descendants of the original characters, it, they're not all living for eight, you know, 300 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, but part of that it has therefore been this great joy of being able to sort of know that I can have this sequence so that mm -hmm. if I plant a seed in book one, I can deliver that in a different way in book three. Mm. But with Labyrinth and then Sepulchre and Citadel, who mm. the, were my first French inspired novels, cut mm -hmm. us on love letters, I didn't plan them as a sequence. But oh. what I found was when I'd written Labyrinth and yeah. I'd written about the 13th century and the Cathars, I just wasn't done with the history of Carcassonne. Yeah. So then I did Sepulchre, which is Fantasy Eckler, the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to write a resistance story because everywhere we go in Carcassonne, in the Bastide, the main town, mm. um, the streets are named after resistance fighters. And so for me, all of my interest in history often comes as it did with the burning chambers and the yeah. Huguenots and arriving in Franschhoek and wondering mm -hmm. why yeah. the main street was called Huguenot Street. Yeah. Um, my history is about curiosity. Mm. And so it's not simply that I think I must write a story set in Carcassonne. I'm mm. just curious to know yeah. what Carcassonne was like in 1562. Yeah. I know what it was like in yeah. 1209. Mm. I now know what it was like in 1944. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to know what it was like during the wars of religion. Mm. Was it uh, a city divided? Mm -hmm. Was it a Catholic city? Did mm -hmm. it remain Catholic? Did it yeah. become Huguenot? So for me, writing historical fiction is about being curious. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I suppose curious about the place, the history, the people. Yeah. And how it all fits together. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. So, um, I mean, how long do you tend to sort of leave it between books? I mean, how long does it mm -hmm. take for you to be re-inspired okay. and go to another place? and? and be well i mean with the curious about it with this um the idea for this i realized started way back in 2010 yeah but i wasn't in a position to research and write it right and then over a period of time it started to take shape and then i was in a position to research and write the actual writing of the burning chambers probably in terms of from the first draft to mm. my editor going okay mm -hmm. off it goes was probably a year um but i've done all the big history research for the whole series and then I will dip I dip in with each new book to the specifics of that book mm -hmm. so all of the um, the big story of the wars of religion and the consequences of it that I did before I started writing right okay. now I'm writing the city of tears which is the second mm, one yeah. which starts a few days before the notorious St Bartholomew's Day massacre in Paris in 1572, right. which is the one thing that most people know about the wars of religion, Yeah, uh, when all the Huguenots were massacred yes. in leadership and it yeah. changed the course of the wars. Mm. There were another five wars after that, mm. but that's really when the tenor of it all changed. Mm -hmm. um, but it's mostly set in Amsterdam. Right. Because by that stage, Amsterdam was becoming the great refugee city of Europe. Oh, okay, London yeah. too, of yeah, course. Yeah. Um, but the Huguenot story in London and England, as it mm. then was, has been told a lot and told very well. Mm. Um, so I'm always interested in finding the, the less known story. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I love yeah. Amsterdam. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm just, I have a writer's fellowship there for April and I'm just about to go and camp oh, out in excellent. Amsterdam. And that will be essential because it's that same thing of getting under the skin of a city yes. before I start writing about yeah. it. Yeah, oh, wonderful. What I'm working on, obviously, the, the great, uh, great privilege of, of writing a sequence of books mm. is that for the first time ever, when I gave in the Burning Chambers to my editor, normally most of us who were writers feel a sense of grief a little mm. bit because you're saying goodbye to those characters yes, for the first time ever I'm not the thing that's really hard at the moment because I'm writing the City of Tears which is set mm. at the end of the um, 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century mm -hmm. um, I'm still playing with them mm -hmm. the only thing that's really hard is that mm. I'm doing events for the Burning Chambers which mm. is just out in paperback and people are saying I love this and I love that and I love those people yeah. I'm thinking your headspace is somewhere I've else. Killed it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and they say, "Oh, I hope nothing's going to go wrong." Oh, ooh. and it's very, weird. It's for, and I have to just shut my ears to it because mm. the story is the story. Yeah, and people think that because it's your book, you could just decide to not kill that character or not do this to that character mm. or have this terrible thing, but the, the characters are there to serve the plot. Yes, and if. They have to die, as the great Annie Prue once said to me. They have to die. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm working on that, and I'm also do, working on an adaptation of one of my own novels, a stage adaptation of oh, uh, wow. The Taxidermist Daughter. Oh, nice. Um, which is great. And we're oh, also wow. I'm also involved with a, a screenplay for The Winter Coast. Oh, wow. Um, so I've got three very distinct types of writing going on at the moment. Gosh, and yeah. That, that's, that's quite a challenge. I was going to say, yeah, that's, that's a hell of a lot to have going yeah. on all at once. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't do it all at once. I do one <laughs> thing, then I put it aside, I'm going to do something else. You know, it's yeah. the skill of parenting. Yeah, okay. Don't, don't do Fair it all enough. at once. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so you, I can imagine you, you'd have to get into a certain headspace for each uh, thing. Well, I think the thing is also, your responsibility as a novelist is to create the entire world. Mm -hmm. Your responsibility as a playwright is to create brilliant moments of dialogue between characters and mm -hmm. motivation for them. But your job is not to describe the chair at the mm -hmm. back of the room. In um, a screenplay, your job is to write images. Mm -hmm. So for me, my novels are 120,000 words long. Mm -hmm. A long play is about 25,000 words, and a screenplay is about 12. Mm -hmm. So that's my challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Where are all the words? Yeah. 